Hey everyone, it's me again. I'm Wave Theory, and by now you know me from my channel where I review audio gear, which has been mostly headphone stuff to this point. Uh, but I have been teasing this video, and it grew into a series of videos, it turns out, of which this is going to be the first part. Right? Um, but I have teased these videos about building a scientific case for why we humans can, in fact, hear differences in audio cables. Okay, I know that is a contentious topic in our hobby right now, um, and has been for a long time. Um, and so I'm just going to try to add to the conversation in a way that I think is helpful. So let me say a couple of things about myself that I have said before, but you may have missed um, in some bulk of video, the bulk of videos that I've done, or if you didn't watch the intro videos that I made when this channel first launched a few months ago. And so some of these are this, okay? I hear differences in cables. I do, okay? Um, I didn't want to. So I, I will level with you on that one. Like I initially started in this hobby very much more in, in the cables don't matter um, uh, camp. Okay. Um, that you can't measure a difference or the measure, the, the differences that you do measure are so tiny as so as to be inaudible. And, you know, we struggle to replicate these things in blind AB tests and that sort of thing. So I was, I, I was in the cables don't matter camp for a very long time, a number of years. And then it was, uh, it was with my, my hi Feynman HE1000 V2 headphone first, where this really happened. Like the, I bought that used in the seller, bundled it with a Plus Sound Poetic GPH headphone cable, which I did not use right away. I just kept using my, my heart cables that I had at the time because Hart's modular system is brilliant. And so, I mean, I really like Hart's company and their, their business model, and I wish them all the luck. Um, going forward. Um, but I was noticing particularly with that, that heck V2, that the heart cable, like there was, there was something weird going on. Like the, the center image was drifting a little bit. And, you know, I had two identical heart cables of that, um, that type. It was a dual 2.5 millimeter, uh, cable. And both of those 2.5 millimeter cables were just like the, the center image on that heck V2 was wobbling a little bit on me. And that, so I was just like, I, I don't know what's going on. But I have this other cable here that I can at least just use to check to see if there's just something weirdness going on with these other two cables. And I plug that plus sound cable in and just bang, that center image locked. But that wasn't the only thing that happened. Like the, tr the tonal balance and the treble, like the cymbals just sounded more natural and real. Okay, and they, they weren't as peaky or shimmery in their frequency response. The spatial presentation just became more coherent, not just that center image locking, but just like everything just sounded bigger and like I was hearing things in a real space to a much more convincing level than I was with the heart cables. Okay, so I didn't want to hear that. I didn't expect to hear that. And I was really floored when that happened. And so then I started exploring, like not paying attention to a cable type, just getting a higher quality of cable. And more often than not, I would sit down not knowing what I might hear that was different between like a stock cable or a cheap generic cable and a fancier cable. And uh, I'd sit down and I'd like listen to these things and like, oh, yeah, there's a difference here. Well, crap. Okay. I don't want there to be a difference there. Specifically, I don't want the more expensive cables to actually be worthwhile because I would rather spend that extra money on better headphones or better amps or better DACs or, I don't know, other useful accessories like headphone stands or something. So I have a place to put this big collection of headphones that I'm accumulating and all of that. But nope, turns out those headphone cables really can make a difference and that they need to be part of the story and part of the, the consideration. So I just, I offer that as an anecdote to say that I'm not here to be anyone's enemy. I'm not here with an ax to grind. 
I'm here sharing my experience that when I really sat down and listened to two cables, like there were noticeable differences. <clears throat> I have also blind tested, well, not blind, I should say, but um, I am partnered in this life to a wonderful woman, and she is even smarter than me. So if you think this channel is our best foot forward um, in life to the public eye, it's not, okay, it's her. But anyway, um, she is a scientist, okay? She has a, a dual PhD and all that. She knows how to do um, research methodology and all of that. And I just sat her down with a plus sound cable and a heart cable, showed her how to switch everything in and out, let her pick the tracks and everything that she wanted. And she just started switching back and forth on a Bayer DT880. And when she was done, she came back upstairs and she's like, I'm going to make the claim that this one, and she, and, you know, she pointed to the, uh, the plus sound. She's like, I'm going to make the claim that this one is better. I just hear more from it. Okay. Um, and she doesn't know anything about audio. She did not know that that cable was supposed to be better or how it was supposed to be better or anything like that, but she came to that conclusion on her own. So that's where I'm going to transition to. I am also a scientist, okay? I, um, I have a dual PhD in physics and in STEM education, STEM being the acronym for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. My PhD work uh, was to look at how students translate the math they use in their math classes, specifically undergrad students. Um, like, you know, take the math they learn in, say, their freshman and sophomore years of college and then translate that to how physics courses use math, okay, in junior, senior level physics courses. And so that required me to dig deep into how brains work and process information and take in information and learn them and make and learn novel things and make sense of things and that sort of thing. And so that's, so I'm coming at this from a physics standpoint. I can explain some of the workings of that. I'm coming at this from a neurological standpoint where I can talk a little bit about what's going on in the brain and so forth. Um, and so I'm going to try to put those science worlds together. Okay. And I'm going to do that because since I have made an observation and an observation that surprised me and I didn't expect, okay, that being that cables can make a difference. And I'll also set the stage here that the context that we are talking about is with analog signal cables, such as speaker cables, headphone cables, um, RCA and XLR analog interconnects. That's the kind of cable that I'm going to start with in this series and build the case for those. Maybe someday down the road we'll come back and we'll hit USB and digital cables and all of that. But for right now, I just want to do analog interconnect headphone and speaker cables, okay? Those kinds of things, okay? Since I observed a thing that I didn't expect to observe with those cables, and since I am a scientist, then what I want to do is to put forth and create a testable evidence-based hypothesis for why we humans might be able to discern differences, sonic differences in these cables, okay? So that's what I'm going to do here, hopefully, with this series, is put forth a testable evidence-based hypothesis for why that might be, okay? Now, that's not going to be the answer. I offer these ideas to the community to be dissected, to be tested, to be challenged, because this is how science is done, uh, all right? I put these ideas out there for scrutiny. We'll see what holds up, all right? And so thanks for being here on the first part of the journey, and uh, thanks for listening to my little bit of a background story here. And I hope that this moves the conversation about do cables matter forward in a productive and helpful way that even if I don't change any minds, I hope we all learn something useful and that we all benefit from this. So, all right, that will be all for the on-camera portion of this, uh, of this part of the video. The rest of it will be a PowerPoint, but you will still hear my voice a lot. So, Say goodbye to my face and just keep listening to my voice, please. All right. See ya. 
Alright, this is Wave Theory's voice here to guide us the rest of the way. So let's start building that evidence-based hypothesis for why humans might be able to hear cable differences. And again, this video series will focus on analog signal cables, headphone cables, and speaker cables. Someday down the road I might come back and discuss USB cables, digital cables, and power cables, but for now, let's run with analog signal cables. As I mentioned, this will be a series of videos and we are in part one right now. I think to do a complete and thorough job building this evidence-based hypothesis, we also need to discuss sound waves and wave superposition, alternating current signal transmission, human pattern recognition, i.e. the brain side of all of this stuff, and then I'll tie all those ideas together into what is hopefully a coherent evidence-based hypothesis that could be tested. Finally, I'll address some of the common rebuttals out there for why many believe cables don't matter. Now, please bear with me as this series will be long and a lot of work. It's really a labor of love and will take me a fair amount of time to put together in its entirety, so please be patient. All right, on with the science. I want you to consider this question. What is science? No, seriously, think about it. Pause this video. Come up with a definition for science in your own words. Really. I'll wait. Okay. You back? Have you ever really considered this question before? Was it harder than you thought after having a dozen plus years of school? In our audio hobby, the word science gets thrown around a lot, usually in the context of trying to give strength to a position based on measurements or what types of measurements we should use or something like that. Since this is a video series where I want to use science to develop an evidence-based hypothesis, I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about what science really is. Hopefully, that will mean that any subsequent conversations about these ideas will be coming from a common understanding of what science is and when and how it can be used. There are really two key aspects of science. In other words, it has a dual nature. Science is both a process and a body of knowledge. It is the process by which we humans gain knowledge about the natural world and is the collection of all of the knowledge we have gained through that process over the millennia. I would argue that of these two natures, the process aspect is the more important because it lays out the means by which we have gained our existing knowledge and will gain more knowledge in the future. If I had to give a simple one-sentence textbook definition of the term science, though, it would be something like, science is the search for explanations of natural phenomena. This definition is simple, yet still captures this dual nature we're talking about here. It emphasizes the procedural nature of science in the idea of search, and also captures the body of knowledge aspect of science because the results of those searches are explanations, aka knowledge. Now, these ideas have consequences that need to be explored, so let's unpack this dual nature a little bit more and talk about some of the fundamental traits of science. The definition of science we just discussed is still rather broad and frankly, it can take a lifetime to understand. Despite my years of grad school and being both a scientist and science educator, I still don't count myself as having fully grasped exactly what science is. But I can confidently say that there are some fundamental traits that are super important, such as, Science is a way of knowing. This idea overlaps a lot with the science as a process idea from the previous slide, but it goes deeper. Science is also a collection of methods and ways of thinking that allows us to gain new knowledge about the physical world around us and even in us. Truthfully, science being a way of knowing might be the most important part about it. Because science is a way of knowing, then the knowledge we gain from it is simultaneously reliable, yet also tentative. 
Scientific knowledge is reliable in that it can be trusted, depended upon, and used. The very existence of this video is an example of scientific knowledge being reliable, trustworthy, and usable. I'm creating this presentation on a computer and then publishing it on the internet. You're watching this presentation on a computer or smartphone or other YouTube delivery device. All of that technology is built on theories of electromagnetism, quantum theory, our knowledge of the structure of atoms, and the behavior of electrons, just to name a few. But every time you walk or drive across a bridge, you trust scientific knowledge. Every time you heat up food in a microwave oven, you trust scientific knowledge. You even brush your teeth, hopefully at least twice a day, because we trust science. The process of science yields knowledge that is very trustworthy and can be used. Yet, all of that knowledge is also tentative. Scientists mean tentative in a more rigorous way than it is used in everyday language, though. What it means here is that all scientific knowledge is subject to refinement or change with the discovery of new evidence. In everyday language, we say things like, let's tentatively schedule a lunch meeting for Friday, which usually means we think that that Friday lunchtime will work, but we don't have all the facts and can abandon this quickly if any conflicts pop up. Or we'll describe an athlete who seems unsure of what they're doing as playing tentatively. To say scientific knowledge is tentative is simply stating that we don't know all there is to know yet and likely can't know all there is to know anytime soon or maybe ever. Therefore, there is always the possibility that new information will come along that shows us we need to modify our current understanding. But because so much work and thought and challenges to that work and thought already happened before a scientist makes a public declaration that they think they have new knowledge, they make that statement with a fair degree of confidence. And it takes more science to show that their thinking needs to be modified. In other words, we're not changing our minds about the theory of evolution tomorrow just because a charismatic intelligent design proponent made a TikTok video. No, it takes more science and new, rigorously obtained and analyzed evidence to substantively challenge existing science. Science is also descriptive, but not prescriptive. Descriptive means that science gives us explanations as to how the physical world operates and can also predict when and where some natural events will happen. However, it cannot tell us what to do with that knowledge. So while science can inform policy decisions and the like, it cannot make policy decisions for us. What we do with scientific knowledge happens outside the scope of science. Science is also a social enterprise. One of the reasons that we can be confident in scientific knowledge is because once a bit of knowledge reaches a level where we can trust and use it, it has been picked apart, challenged, and dissected from every angle that dozens, hundreds, or sometimes even thousands of people along the way could think of. Socially, science is both collaborative and competitive. Many scientists work together, putting their mental abilities together to come up with the best explanation they can as a group. Then, they share those explanations and ideas with other scientists who didn't work with them. It is the job of these other scientists to poke around and find and root out any weaknesses in these new ideas. What survives through all of that, and often multiple rounds of this over many years, is good and reliable information. But with all those people involved who sometimes want each other's work to succeed and sometimes don't, it's very social. It's also very messy and slow, but it does a good job of making sure the best understanding we humans can offer at the time shakes free. This social aspect also means the subjective is inherently interwoven with the objective. Every scientist is a human, 
and therefore brings their own biases, experiences, and ideas that are shaped by their upbringings and professional successes and failures in whatever social environments they come from. The data they collect may be objective, but their interpretations of that data will always be subjective to some degree. This subjectivity is another reason why it is necessary for science to be a slow and highly social process. It takes lots of minds putting in lots of effort to make sure we sift through the subjectivity as much as possible. There comes a time, though, when the result moves into objective territory pending further evidence. And this is how we weed out ideas that are too subjective or too far afield. Good ideas will inevitably connect to the available data and usually be helpful in making predictions about future natural events, like when the next lunar eclipse will occur. This also means that not everyone's ideas are inherently of equal initial quality. Some ideas connect data more effectively and make better predictions than others. It's the social process of dissecting all those ideas that allows the truth to eventually emerge. So in audio, we talk about measurements a lot, but what are they? Measuring things is a way to gather objective data and help us along that process of knowing that is science. In practice, a measurement is a comparison with a standard. When we measure the height of a person, we compare the length of their body with a standard bit of length. In most places of the world, that standard bit of length is a meter, or fractions of a meter, like centimeters, or multiples of a meter, like a kilometer. Although, it doesn't make sense to measure a human's height in kilometers. Here in the United States, we stubbornly use feet and inches. To say someone is 5 feet 10 inches tall is to compare their length to the standard bits of length known as the foot and the inch. In electrical circuits, one of the standard units we use is the volt. To say we measure an electric potential difference of 5 volts is to say that the difference in electric potential energy per unit charge we measured is equal to 5 of those standard little bits of electric potential energy per unit charge. Let's think a little bit more about measurements though. While they are a comparison with a standard, they are also a way of observing things. They are one way of making a formal observation that can be easily communicated to someone else who has not observed that thing. In that way, it is an aspect of doing science, but simply measuring things is not itself doing science. Measurements need to be interpreted and contextualized to make any sense. Doing a set of measurements and comparing those measurements with some thresholds to make judgments of good versus bad or recommend versus not recommend is not doing science. Let's say we've measured things and have numbers. Great. What does it all mean? That's where the science part really comes in. But there is going to be the subjective creeping in during figuring out what that means. That brings us back to the point on the last slide about how the subjective is inherently intertwined with the objective in science and how science provides a process for sifting through all of that. Another point I want to make under the umbrella of bringing science into this audio cables issue is that human observations, specifically information we gather from our senses, have always played a central role in the generation of scientific knowledge. Going all the way back to the ancient Greeks, humans have been using and refining our use of our five senses to understand what's going on in the world around us. To be fair, one should always be wise about which senses we observe which things. I don't want to make observations about cow dung using my sense of taste, for example. But humans mapped the night sky, determined the size of this planet, figured out the basic structure of the solar system, developed the first vaccines, and so much more based on carefully observing phenomena with our own senses and then putting careful thought into how and why we were observing those things. Even now in the 21st century, 
Lots of science relies heavily on what we can observe with our own senses. Lots of medical science is done through observing and describing symptoms. Simply put, doctors carefully apply their senses and use that data to draw conclusions about medical conditions or make decisions about what more observations need to be made, like blood work or MRIs or x-rays. Now, human observations are connected to human brains. Shocker, right? And that also means that a bunch of pitfalls come with using sensory data. Our brains can be and are fooled. A lot. So using our senses is still a messy, complex, fraught endeavor that requires a lot of efforts to work through. I will talk more about these pitfalls and how they relate to audio perception in part four of this series. But despite such challenges, human observation is still a foundational tool in science. Many objectivist audiophiles like to dismiss human sensory reports, calling them untrustworthy, or saying that any differences someone claims to hear are just the result of a placebo effect. Well, like it or not, using input from our senses has always been used, and using them is here to stay, warts and all. Furthermore, to call a difference someone hears a placebo is often very hand-wavy and overly dismissive. The placebo effect is a real thing, but it's also a scientific explanation that requires evidence. That's right. You actually have to have direct evidence that a placebo effect is happening to say that some, what someone is observing is the result of a placebo. Also, to my knowledge, there are no documented applications of the placebo effect outside of medical testing. So let's be careful how and where we use this term. Finally, observing something that is not readily explainable is where science starts. We see or hear or smell or feel or taste something we don't understand. Why is that happening? Is that normal? Those are all questions we start asking. Sometimes hearing differences isn't something that should be quickly explained away. It's just something that needs to be explained. All right, that does it for part one of this series about building a evidence-based hypothesis for why humans might be able to hear differences in analog audio cables. Uh, so thanks for watching, and again, this is going to be a long video series of multiple parts, and I am making and publishing one part per time, so stick around and keep an eye out for this. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe to my channel, and until next time, enjoy the music.